I don't know if that sounds, sounds like this. This is an old Greek accent. No one knows what it sounds like. It's all, it's all fixed. It's canon now. Um, so, there's a podcast that I like a lot. That helps me understand this weird world that you do. That is sometimes terrible and sometimes beautiful. It, uh, the idea of the podcast, as the host will explain, is that you take different facets of the human-centered world and you rate them on a five-star scale and I say we, I of course, mean John Green, the host of the Advocacy Review. Should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? 
should old acquaintance be forgot and all lang syne. And versions of that date back at least 400 years. But we owe the current song to the great Scottish poet Robert Burns. In December of 1788, he wrote to his friend Francis Dunlop, is not the Scotch phrase "Auld Lang Syne exceedingly expressive? There's an old song in tune which has long thrilled through my soul. Light be the turf on the breast of the heaven-inspired poet who composed this glorious fragment. On the back of the letter, Burns wrote a draft of the poem. At least three of the verses were probably his own, but he later said that he took the song down, quote, from an old man. And part of what makes dating the first verse so difficult is the poem's eternality. It's about drinking together and remembering old times. And almost every idea in the song, from picking daisies to wandering through fields to toasting old friends over a beer, could have been written 500 or 1,000 or even 3,000 years ago. It's also a rousing ode to splitting the check, by the way. <laughs> Part of the second verse going, and surely you'll buy your pint cup, and surely I'll buy mine. <laughs> but mostly, the song is just an unapologetic celebration of the good old days. I guess I should tell you that Amy is dead. Otherwise, her death within this review might seem like some kind of narrative device, which I don't want, so... She's dead. The rare present tense sentence that once it becomes true, stays true. But we were still in the past, I think. She asked me if I had anything for the radio, and I sent her three essays, and she liked one of them, and asked me to come in and record it for her show on Chicago's public radio station. In the broadcast, you could hear the nerves in my voice. It was the first time I'd ever reached such a large audience. After that, Amy invited me to be on her show more often. Sometimes Amy would take me out to lunch. She was everything I wanted to be, happily married, a committed and loving parent, a successful writer. At our first lunch, I told her that when I moved to Chicago, my mom asked me to carry $40 with me in my left pants pocket whenever I went outside so I would have something to give anyone who might want to mug me. And I told Amy, this is true, <laughs> I told Amy that I still always kept 40 bucks in my left pocket, and that I tried never to spend my mugging money except in cases of real need. <laughs> Amy was also a wonderful gift giver, and the next time we met, she surprised me with two gifts. One was a money clip engraved with my initials, JMG and the other was a money clip engraved with M.M. It's <laughs> <laughs> money. In April of 2002, Amy convened some of her writer and musician friends for an event at the Chopin Theater in Chicago called Writer's Block Party. She asked me to read for it, and I did, and people laughed at my stupid jokes. And Amy hired someone to walk around the theater giving everyone compliments, and the complimenter said that they liked my shoes, which were these Adidas sneakers. And that is why I have worn Adidas sneakers almost every day for the last 17 years. <laughs> Burns originally had a different tune in mind for All the Lang Syne, which he himself acknowledged was mediocre. But the tune we know now first appeared in 1799 in George Thompson's Select Songs of Scotland. By then, Robert Burns was gone. He was only 37 when he died of a heart condition, likely exacerbated by his habit of raising many a pint glass to old acquaintances. <laughs> but the song was just getting started. Within decades, it became a popular part of New Year's Eve celebrations in Scotland. By 1818, Beethoven had written an arrangement of it, and it was beginning to travel throughout the world. Today, Auld Lang Syne is often played at Japanese department stores just before they close. Between 1945 and 1948, the tune was used in South Korea's national anthem and it's a staple of film soundtracks, from Charlie Chaplin's 1925 film The Gold Rush 
to It's a Wonderful Life in 1946, to Minions in 2015. <laughs> I think Auld Lang Syne is popular in Hollywood not just because it's in the public domain and therefore cheap, but also because it's the rare song that is genuinely wistful. It acknowledges human longing without romanticizing it, and it captures how each new year really is a product for all the old ones. When I sing Auld Lang Syne on New Year's Eve, I forget the words, like everybody does, until I get to the fourth verse, which I do have memorized. We too have paddled in the stream from morning sun till dine, but seas between us broad have roared since all Lang Syne. And I think about the many broad seas that have roared between me and my past, seas of neglect, seas of time, seas of death. I'll never speak again to many of the people who loved me into this moment, just as you will never speak to many of the people who loved you into your now. And so we raise a glass to them and hope that perhaps somewhere they are raising a glass to us. In her strange and beautiful final book, textbook Amy Krauss Rosenthal, Amy wrote, if one is generously contracted 80 years, that amounts to 29,220 days on Earth. Playing that out then, how many times really do I get to look at a tree? 12,395? There has to be an exact number. Let's just say it's 12,395. Absolutely, that is a lot. But it is not infinite, and anything less than infinite seems too measly a number and is not satisfactory. In her writing, Amy often sought to reconcile the infinite nature of consciousness and love and yearning with the finite nature of the universe and all that inhabits it. For me, at least, Auld Lang Syne captures exactly what it feels like to see a bright pink flower peeking out through the asphalt, or how it feels to know that you have 12,395 times to look at a tree. In 2005, my wife Sarah got into graduate school at Columbia, and so we left Chicago for New York. Amy and I stayed in touch and collaborated some over the next decade, but it was never again like it had been in those early days before I got famous. Being famous was disorienting for me. I either lied about how work was going or else told the ridiculous truth, which was that I was often unhappy and felt scared all the time and didn't know what to do. Amy was, as always, sage counsel when we talked, and I was always honest with her because she made it easy. And she calmly directed me back toward Sarah, toward my family, toward the foundational relationships in my life that weren't contingent upon book sales. She found out that she had cancer not long after finishing the textbook, and she called me. She knew that in the years after The Fault in Our Stars was published, I'd come to know many young people who were gravely ill, and she wanted to know if I had advice for her. I told her what I think is true, that love survives death, but she wanted to know how young people react to death, how her kids would. She wanted to know if her kids and her husband would be okay, and that picked me up. Although I'm usually quite comfortable talking with sick people. With my friend, I found myself stumbling over words, overwhelmed by my own sadness and worry. They won't be okay, of course, but they will go on and the love you poured into them will go on. That's what I should have said. What I actually said while crying was, how can this be happening? You do so much yoga. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for laughing at my mortification. <laughs> In my experience, dying people often have wonderful stories of the horrible things that healthy people say to them. But I've never heard of anybody saying anything as stupid 
as you do so much yoga. <laughs> I hope that Amy at least got some narrative mileage out of me saying something so wildly idiotic to her in her hour of need. But I also know that I failed her after she was there for me so many times. I know that she forgives me, but still I desperately wish I could have said something useful or perhaps not said anything at all. When people we love are suffering, we want to make it better. But sometimes, often, in fact, you can't make it better. I'm reminded of something my supervisor said to me when I was a student chaplain at a children's hospital. Don't just do something. Stand there. All Lang Syne was a popular song in World War I. Versions of it were sung in the trenches, not just by British soldiers, but by French and German and Austrian ones as well. And the song even played a small role in one of the strangest and most beautiful moments in world history, the Christmas truce of 1914. On Christmas Eve that year, in part of the war's Western Front in what is now Belgium, around 100,000 British and German troops emerged from their trenches and met each other in the so-called no man's land between their front lines. One 19-year-old British soldier wrote his mother, yesterday the British and Germans met and shook hands on the ground between the trenches and exchanged souvenirs. Marvelous, isn't it? A German soldier remembered that a British soldier, quote, brought a soccer ball from their trenches and pretty soon a lively game ensued. How marvelously wonderful, yet how strange it was. Elsewhere on the front, Captain Sir Edward Hulse recalled a Christmas sing-along that, quote, ended up with all Lang Syne, which we all, English, Scots, Irish, Prussians, Wittenbergers, etc., joined in. It was absolutely astounding, and if I had seen it on cinematograph film, I would have sworn it was faked. Hulse, who was 25 years old at the time, would be killed on the Western Front less than four months later. At least 17 million people would die as a direct result of the war. By Christmas 1916, soldiers didn't want truces. The devastating losses of the war and the growing use of poison gas had embittered the combatants. But many also had no idea why they were fighting and dying for tiny patches of ground so far from home. And in the British trenches, soldiers began to sing the tune of Auld Lang Syne with different words. We're here because we're here because we're here because we're here. Here was a world without lies, where life was just meaninglessness all the way down. Modernity had come to war and to the rest of life. The art critic Robert Hughes once referred to the, quote, peculiarly modernist hell of repetition, and the trenches of World War I were hell indeed. Although she was a playful and optimistic writer, Amy was not deluded about the nature of suffering or about its centrality in human life. Her work, whether picture book or memoir, always finds a way to acknowledge misery without getting into it. One of the last lines she wrote was, death may be knocking on my door, but I'm not getting out of this glorious bath to answer it. <laughs> In her public appearances, Amy would often use that recursive lament of British soldiers and transform it without ever changing the tune for the words. She would ask an audience to sing that song with her, we're here because we're here, because we're here, because we're here. And although it is a profoundly nihilistic song written about the modernist hell of repetition, singing the song with Amy, I could always see the hope in it. It became a statement that we are here, meaning that we are together and not alone, and a statement that we are here, that astonishing unlikelihoods has brought this particular us to this particular here, an us that will never exist again, at least not in quite this way. And it's true that we might never know why we are here, but we can still proclaim in hope 
that we are here. I don't think such hope is both foolish or idealistic or misguided. I believe it is, for lack of a better word, true. So I want to ask you to sing with me. Think of those across the broad and roaring seas and sing with me. You won't be more of two than I am. <laughs> <laughs> we're here because we're here, because we're here, because we're here. Here's a minotaur. Oh, and it's just wonderful because I get to understand. 
understand that world a little bit more. That world that now exists that didn't so much just a few scant years ago. I've been around for thousands of years, so this is all very new to me. Uh, now to Liverpool. Uh, so, without any of your new access, I would like to welcome to the stage Hank and Catherine Brain for a long time. Everything about your name. Is that okay? No. 
I don't know, it's a little, it feels, it feels like a bit of an affront to be like, there's a thing I don't like about here. No, I don't care. I, I didn't pick it. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Like, it, it has to be, it has to be the name with the most spellings. Because there's, you could put like four different Y's in, you could do a C or a K, you could do an I with no E, you can have an E, you can have E's in the beginning maybe. This just, it, it, it's also very long. It is long. So if you had a long last name, there'd be all kinds of forms you could never fill out. Yeah. Yeah, I could never fit my whole name in that, like, all those squares. testing. Yeah, because your middle name is long too. <laughs> Why did they do this to you? Didn't pick those either. Hank! <laughs> Fast. It's out real fast. It's nice. When we're at a coffee shop, Catherine orders first, and then I put your name, and she's like, Hank! <laughs> call me. Yeah. You don't need to know. You call me Hank. Yeah. I cannot dispel this name, and then they write, Hey. Uh, many people have thoughts about their names, Catherine, and I'm not going to talk about it because I'd rather talk about this problem that I have. Okay, let me, let me hear it. January 9th. Today marks the ninth day of me having Downeaster Alexa in my head. Someone help. Uh, down, does anyone know what Down Easter Alexa is? All oh, eight of you. Yeah, we're really on the podcast, so yeah. You. Yeah, I gotta catch up. It's a Billy Joel song about Long Island fishermen, uh, because that was a necessary topic uh, to cover. Uh, hey, what? I'm sorry. Catherine looks like she's mad at me. <laughs> Just because you've never heard of the plight of the fishermen of Long Island doesn't mean it's not. Yeah, valid. that's true. It's a valid plight. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, also, <laughs> and also, Billy Joel knows all about the valid plight of the Long Island Fisherman. Do you guys want to hear a couple bars? <laughs> well, I don't remember any. Well, I have a heart of the town in Scarlet No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> there ain't no island left for islanders like me, so if you see my Down Easter Alexa. That's the name of his ship. That's his ship's name, the Down Easter Alexa. I guess both. Yeah. yeah. Tell my wife I am the only guy I did. I'm a freshman singer. It sounds a little bit like that. Now that I said it and you said it, now I feel like I shouldn't have gone. Oh, it's sad. <laughs> no, he's just fishing. <laughs> Very deep water. Single deep. Um, so uh, this was a response to a tweet that I tweeted 12 days before, uh, in which I talked about how Downing Street Alexa was in my head. So it was actually 12 days. It wasn't mine. And then I tweeted my most controversial tweet of the week. Anybody got a good Spotify playlist that's like 0% Billy Joel? <laughs> a lot of people got mad at me. They were like, impossible! Doesn't exist! Not a thing! Yeah, and apparently they got decontextualized. Uh, Lindsay was playing with Joe Franco's wife, came at me pretty hard. Because she's apparently, like, people like added lens and was like, Lindsay, did you see this tweet? <laughs> A man spoke ill of Billy. Well, yeah. I have thoughts. Yes, they said, Lindsay DeFranco is going to be so disappointed in you, and she said, thank you for bringing this to my attention. Such foolishness should not be tolerated. <laughs> And then she said, post that <laughs> uh, So I got a lot of great Spotify playlists, though. It was right before we got on the plane, and I've been like chilling out to people's twos. Yeah, coming across weird, real good stuff, real yeah. weird stuff. Yeah, I don't listen to enough music because I'm so I'm so busy looking at Twitter and also listening to audiobooks. I like I've, I've like lost my like time to to. Listen to music. And I think the only thing that happens is Orn says, 
hey Google, can you play a Taste of Honey by Herb Alpert? And then... And then we listened to a Taste of Honey by Herb Alpert for the 59th time that day. <laughs> do, you, do you know who Herb Alpert is? <laughs> then a different song tries to come on and he says no. No. <laughs> My Mom. Taste of Honey Mom. again. <laughs> Uh, yeah, all the Herb Alpert fans in the audience. Um, I wasn't really. I love it. I wasn't like, caught up on Herb Alpert, and then like yeah. we we entered yeah. this world somehow, and it's wonderful. Herb Alpert has sold seventy million albums. I, we may have, but these people don't listen to the podcast. And I mean, what a man! Is that this podcast heard? about Twitter? It and her album. Okay. <laughs> um, so earlier today, I was in an airport, and oh yeah, and That's I what happened to, hey, yeah. So many things happened today. So many things have happened today. Yes, it's been a long one. We got up at three o'clock in the morning our time. It's fine. We're good. We slept some. A little bit. Um, so I got one of these, so it printed out crafting boarding pass, perfectly pristine, beautiful boarding pass. Got halfway through mine and it just went black. <laughs> and then a logo of the machine came up, this NCR at the top there, that came up and it was, and I was like, this has never happened before. And it was a Windows, air, like, boot screen, and I was like, oh, it's Windows, it's good old XP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what, I, tweet, I tweeted this, people were like, what year are you flying? <laughs> I, I didn't. It didn't feel super like old when I when I was standing there, but now that I look at it, it really does. It does feel quite ancient. Um, and and then I I just gave up. I dissociate myself from it because it was just too much. You just walk away. I don't know how to handle this. What happens now? Too much to deal with. Do you even exist anymore? Am I supposed to touch that? What am I supposed to? No, do? definitely walk away. I mean. I could try and start Windows normally, but there actually isn't a way to input information into the <laughs> device. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was not able to do that. Um, and then I like at the back there's a sign that says, go there faster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But I got on the plane, everything was fine. Everything was fine, except that I forgot to... Uh... Catherine did disappear. <laughs> um, so it was like, there was like maybe a half an hour left that we had to get on the plane. Oh, you told the story. Well, I mean, for kind of like, we were supposed to get up at 5, 5 a.m. Right. to be at the airport. Mm -hmm. And then our flight was delayed to 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. But we were like, we should still get there early. Because who knows what will happen? Who knows what's going to happen? So I was like, we got plenty of time. We got plenty of time. And then I just like went to the bathroom and I went to get coffee. And then like, I looked yeah, at yeah. the and I had like seven <laughs> text messages. <laughs> and there were calls. And I was like, where are you? Yeah, no, I was super weird. John was on the phone with Sarah being like, this is the dumbest piece of message flight of all time. <laughs> 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 all the different coffee shops. She was just like, what did you put? It was fine. It was fine. I mean, the, the, the problem was that there was like no one on the plane. No one was going from St. Petersburg to Raleigh. There were like eight of us. Yeah. And so the plane boarded very quickly. The plane boarded in like two minutes. Yeah, and then it, so then I it left. left. It felt like it felt like it was like now, but then we talked to the agent and they're like, oh, they have 15 minutes. And I was like, oh. Well, hopefully Kevin hasn't been abducted, <laughs> so she'll make it back. It's a little bit I was afraid he would fall unconscious, yeah. or been stolen. <laughs> it seems like a weird place <laughs> to be <laughs> at. Yeah. They're like, damn, the airport, like, like, where are they going to take you? It's a pretty high security zone. Yeah. You don't... Anyway, anyway, we don't have to get into the details of how to steal people. <laughs> uh, probably not great. Do you guys want to do a Twitter thing with me? Yeah, can you, can you open up your phones uh, and type this? You're all like, this isn't how the shows are supposed to go. I don't I'm not know. supposed to look down. This is from Hang the Coop, who says, type I'm such a and let your keyboard expose you. I, don't have I did it for myself. I'm sorry. Of course I didn't bring your phone. That would be terrible. And then tweet it at me. Uh, use the hashtag Pipples and I'll read some of yours. P-I-P-L-E-S. <laughs> that's, our, that's the hashtag for our show. We cannot explain why. It's a deep one. Or absolutely despised. Lindsay says, I'm such a little bit tired. <laughs> Mine was, I'm such a dork. And then the, the main 
that was just a crying laughing emoji. Uh, but then if I looked to the side, it was, I'm such a dork and you're so beautiful. And I was like, that's the perfect topic for our marriage. Uh, and then, so what do we got? Let's look at things. I'm such a good time. Jody, you are. You're black. I'm such a bad kid, but I can't cry. <laughs> to you, and I hope you're doing good. That's good you start out with a brag. I think come back and actually be supportive. You should be like, I hope you're doing good, I'm such a good friend. But no, start out, boy, people have not seen Rise of Skywalker enough. They know I haven't seen it. They're like, hey, come on! I'm like, I'm a child. I'm such a racist. Thanks. And then, I'm black. <laughs> was a great night. <laughs> sure, that was a kiss of a great evening. I'm such a little bit of a little bit of a little bit more. <laughs> I said like bars. He's getting bars out. Yeah. The dance movie. I'm such a little bit of a little bit of a little bit more. Such a little bit of a little bit more. Yeah, I'm a musician. I'm such a big girl. I'm such a little bit of a kind word. I'm such a crazy. <laughs> I like that. Just um, I'm such a bad bitch now. <laughs> Jordan, you're out there? How you feeling? A nice little auditorium here. Oh, Virgo too, jeez. I'm such a mess, man. I don't, I, we all feel it, bro. Absolutely. I'm such a great time to do this. <laughs> and Connor knows what's up. I'm such a kitty. Good to let your phone auto-correct you to confidence <laughs> instead of I'm such a bitch. <laughs> this is great. I love this. This is my favorite new game. Okay, we're gonna do two more and then we're gonna go to our viral moments of joy. Catherine, are you ready? Absolutely, I'm always ready. I'm such a crazy person, but I'm not sorry. Why would you be, Tiffany? Own it! Not this face. We gotta own it. More, more good friends. I'm such a bad guy and a lot of good <laughs> Thank you, Megan, for finishing us off strong. I, you know, uh, sometimes. My favorite superhero villain. <laughs> <laughs> just a lion gold yeah. yeah, the super villain too. Just a lion gold fish. Looks like it smells pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. A lot of gold fish in the trench coat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're moving on to our viral moments of joy. Here is a man who's walking his birds. Sure. 
And if you want to send us your questions, your comments, or some viral moments of joy you find on the internet, you can use the hashtag Pipples. That's P I P L E S. Thank you all so much for listening. See you later. These are in the lobby. It is, it is time for intermission. You now have 20 minutes to relieve yourselves. That's weird to say. And, uh, and, and just and chat about. You can discuss your Twitter game that you've played with people. And that was are you going to use the shepherd so to get me off of here? Uh, and then Steve will be back to introduce your hand to John. And in the meantime, uh, thank you for hanging out. See you next Yeah. <laughs>
Um, but I don't think it counts as a joke if you're not a comedian and you just tell bad dad jokes. I think that's, I think that's okay. It's just being a dad. Right, yeah. Um, hey, listen, before we, uh, before we start, yeah. I just wanted to thank a few people. Yes, please do. Uh, there are a few people here who, I, first, thank, thanks to each of you, but I don't know all of your names. <laughs> I only know a few of your names, <laughs> so I'm going to thank the people whose names I know. Um, John is here, who's a uh, the co-host of one of my all-time favorite podcasts, Election Profit Makers, um, and I just wanted to say thank you for being here and bringing your kid. Also, there's a possibility that one of my favorite authors is here, but I don't want to say her name because when people say my name in, in equivalent situations, I get very uncomfortable and I stop having fun. But if you are here, you know who you are, and thank you, your work has had such a huge impact on my life and my relationship with my kids, and it has given me tons of insights into both childhood and adulthood, and thank you for everything that you do. Also, all the teachers at this high school who have organized this wonderful event for us and the students. We play a lot of super professional theaters, and the tech crew here is just as pro as at those places. We've been to Carnegie Hall, and y'all up there are doing, the, doing it. Thank you. <laughs> probably talked about uh, this evening is in support of uh, our community's efforts uh, to, to help uh, in Sierra Leone reduce maternal and child mortality. And in that effort, one of our staunchest supporters and one of the people who has been with us from day one and who has called us to um, just just to be in this work as much as we can is Claire Golding, who's here tonight and who has raised so much money. Uh, but also uh, is just such a big believer in the in the idea that that it is not necessary to live in a world where in some communities one in 17 women die in childbirth, and it is not necessary to live in a world where in some communities 10% of kids don't live to see the age of five, and that by strengthening systems and thinking about the world of systems instead of just one intervention or another, uh, we can help bring about that world. So I wanted to say thank you to Claire and everybody who supported that. Which includes all of you. So thank you. Thanks for being here again. Um, thanks to my brother for going on tour with me. And a big thanks to Catherine, um, who, you know, is just so great. <laughs> John, we are here in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, which is the city of Oaks, which is why I'm an Oak joke. Whoa! <laughs> And that, I think that's why I got an extra cheer. Was it my guess? Yeah. Are you aware that you're a city of Oaks? Okay, good. Uh, yeah, Missoula is not really the city of, they call it the Garden City, and I'm like, that's, that's just New Jersey. <laughs> but is it New Jersey? They call it the Garden City? I know, I know, I've been there. <laughs> you can see on all the turnpike signs that it's the Garden State. <laughs> when you look and you're like, that looks like a refinery, but okay. <laughs> but we're not here to criticize New Jersey. Yeah! And alienate, and alienate any people here who are from New Jersey. As we say, yes, they have you guys, you guys are everywhere. Wow. All right, let's answer some uh, questions from our listeners, or in this case, our, our viewers and listeners, because all, yes. the, all these questions came from you. And the way that we're going to identify you is via your ambulance song. Some people may be new to the podcast and they don't know what that's a reference to. I had a million dollar idea. Um, or maybe someone else had it and I stole it. It's hard for me to remember sometimes. <laughs> and the million dollar idea was that instead of having that annoying, like really piercing siren um, when you're in an ambulance, which is a terrible thing to hear when you're sick or, or in crisis, uh, you should have an ambulance song that you kind of pre-file and then if you ever find yourself in an ambulance, they play your song the whole way there. Uh, so they're loud. Wow. It's really loud. And so people want to get out of the way, but also you get to listen to a song that's better than, than the actual ambulance siren. There are some problems with this million dollar idea. We don't need to get into all of them. Lots of people are pointing them out to me. 
But it's a fun thing to dream about. It is, this would be part of my, if I ever wrote a dystopian novel, believe you me, everybody would have an ambulance. <laughs> And it would cost so much. Oh, yeah. Like everything in the healthcare system. John, yeah, let's answer this question from Abby and Ryan, whose ambulance song is Shake It Off by Taylor Swift. Gotta have some good vibes going in that situation. You're right. <laughs> Hello, this is Abby and Ryan. Our question is Have either of you ever come across an odd topic or strange fact while doing research for one of your books? And if yes, what did you discover and was it ever added to the book? Mm -hmm. I, I, so I had a scene in my book that takes place, several scenes that take place inside of an airplane that, where there's no one in it and, uh, and things have to happen in the airplane. So I called a man uh, and his Twitter handle was like, airplane guy. I basically said, I think mine's his experts. Yeah, I, 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 I was like, I need someone who's like an airplane guy. And then somebody was like, an airplane guy was funny. Hey, hey. Uh, yeah, no, he's can sort of like an airplane guy. Like when like an airplane thing happens, he's on the cable news. Like they call him up, and like he he's like a professional airplane guy. And uh, like I got on the phone with him. Uh, he was super gregarious and like open to helping me out however I wanted. And I was like, I need to know how you might get into a plane and not through the door. And he was like, Let me tell you a story. <laughs> and I was like, Yay! I need a story. So he once once an airplane. Uh, the door got stuck, and I think this is what happened. So they could have gotten out of the plane other ways. Like, they could have used the emergency exits, but they didn't want to because that's expensive. Um, so they were like, you need to come out. And I don't think there was anybody on the plane at the time. Right. That's um, key. Yeah. And so you need to come out, you need to get into the airplane, but the door won't open. And so he told me how you get into an airplane, which is you crawl in through the nose, uh, the nose landing gear, and you crawl up there, and then there's like a thing where you unscrew all the bolts and then you can get in the airplane. And if you're ever walking around like a 737, you can see the bolts in the floor in the front galley that he that you can like crawl down into the uh, landing gear from. I can't remember the words landing gear. <laughs> I also frequently do this where I learn something and then put it into a book. In fact my novel in abundance of Catherine's is essentially just a series of things that I learned to stitch together <laughs> into, into novel form. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but recently with my podcast, The Anthropocene Review, like, sometimes I'll discover a fact that, so, that I like so much that I'll be like, I think I've got to write 1,200 words so that I can justify telling people that. <laughs> uh, the most recent example of which is that I reviewed uh, Pineapple on Pizza for The Anthropocene Review because I discovered that in the 1960s, Pineapple on Pizza was invented in Canada by a Greek immigrant who was working at a Chinese restaurant and who was inspired by Chinese cuisine to put a South American food on a traditionally Italian dish, which went on to become most popular, not in Hawaii, but in Australia, <laughs> where astonishingly, nationwide, pineapple is the number one topping on pizza. It seems not to be 100% of the people. Yeah, it's a very divisive topic. And so yeah. I was like, man, given that fact, I've got to find 1,200 other words to say about pineapple on pizza because I want to tell that to the people. <laughs> good. Oh, man, I want pizza now. Oh, and there's Canadian bacon. What is Canadian? Is it Canadian bacon? No. Of course it's not. Of course he knows that. Yes. Bacon has no nationality. <laughs> it belongs to the sick of pig. <laughs> it's pig bacon. Thank you. Very much. Do not take that away from them. Actually, just leave it on. Probably be their preference. <laughs> All right. I told you it's going to be a lot of emotional whiplash. <laughs> All right. Hey, what's our next question? It comes from David, whose ambulance song is mm, "Dies Irae." I don't know what that is. Dies Irae. Oh, it's like a chant. Yeah, it's a Gregorian chant. Okay. I mean, it's also it's a. It's a it's we'll also, talk about it. It's also a pop dance song. It's not a pop. As an education, <laughs> <laughs> education major in its final semester at university, I'm prepared to teach English in high school, and I'm slightly afraid of not being the teacher that will inspire my students. What teachers inspired you the most in your education over the years, and what do they do 
to help you see their subject as tangible and worth engaging with outside of just the requirements. Not a giant killer, nor a sling slinger, simply David. But David was just simply David until they were like, hey, there's a Goliath you need to fight, so you never know. And you are going to the education system, so you will have your share. I, I first thing I want to say about this is like, you don't have to be that thing for every student. Because yeah. that is, it's not how it works. It's not like we all come out of the, of the education system and we all pick, like everybody who had Mrs. Grant thinks Mrs. Grant was the one. I think that we all find our own teachers. That yeah, like happens. no matter how inspirational my algebra two teacher was, that just wasn't going to be the person. For you. <laughs> like, I actually have a lot of friends who would cite our algebra two teacher as like the most inspiring, most wonderful teacher. He was a great teacher. It's just he happened to be teaching algebra two, to which I am not inclined. <laughs> for me, the people who made the biggest difference. So, when I was in school, I often felt like I was being asked to jump over a series of arbitrary hurdles uh, for no reason, like they do in hurdle races, you know? Like, whenever I watch a hurdle race, I always think to myself, if they just removed the hurdles, this would go so much faster. <laughs> and that's how I felt in school. I was like, now they're going to make me jump over the Algebra 2 hurdle, and now I have to jump over the American History hurdle. Why? Because the hurdles have been placed here by forces so much larger than me that I cannot begin to imagine them. And it all felt like quite arbitrary, and it felt like the main thing I was trying to do was to get a piece of paper that said that I had learned enough to be a grown-up. And the teachers who mattered to me were the teachers who were so passionate about what they were doing, they were so passionate about their work, about their subject matter, that somehow that passion became infectious and I began to see it not as a series of hurdles, but instead as an opportunity, an opportunity to understand my place in the universe and to understand the universe, an opportunity to understand like how in different periods of history people have communicated themselves, the ideas that matter to them, the questions that matter to them. And, and, and how to have like conversations through space and time with the magic of reading and things like that. That was the stuff that really got me. So I think, for me, it comes down to passion and finding a way to hold on to that passion even when you're around students who, if they're anything like me, <laughs> are super difficult and can be kind of annoying. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that like being open to that kind of passion in front of a bunch of uh, maybe somewhat intentionally detached in order to protect themselves, students, right, uh, can be difficult because like they they are in a world to some extent where they have to protect their identities because like it's not easy in high school or middle school to to be a person, um, and so I think a lot of the sort of aloofness that comes with uh, high school is, a, is, you know, it's protection. Um, oh, yeah. So I'm breaking through that. It feels, definitely feels like you, if you show the world your, your, your vulnerable belly, yes. that it will devour you. <laughs> I mean, because, like, yeah, I, I felt that way throughout middle school and then through most of high school. By the way, if you're in middle school or high school right now, um, and, it's, and it's great, that's, I'm so happy for you. And if it's not great, it's, it's okay, and, and I, I'm sorry that it sucks, but it, I promise it will get better. Um, it is temporary. High school is temporary. You will not always feel the way that you feel in high school. I feel like the biggest achievement in my life in a lot of ways was um, making it to adulthood. <laughs> <laughs> I'm extremely, I'm extremely proud of that, and all I ever want to talk about when I see old friends is, oh my god, can you believe that we're here? <laughs> <laughs> this next question comes from Meredith, who would like to hear Highway to Hell by ACDC. <laughs> <laughs> Meredith is working, dear Andy John, says Meredith, I'm working at NASA this semester as an intern. Awesome. So I'm like 0.001% sure that they might be hiding aliens somewhere at the research base I would be at. I want to be on the lookout in case we are living in that very small percentage chance universe. Can you help me come up with a game plan? How do I find the potential secret aliens? Where might they be? What if my one of my co-workers is one of them? <laughs> in fear of inevitable heat death merit, uh, I mean, first of all, that shouldn't even be in your top thousand worries. No, it should. Well, I disagree. Yeah, no, what you gotta do. Hold on, let me get up again. You don't even have a list. You, you haven't even finished your top thousand yet, have you? Mm, number 
but this next question comes from Leo. He <laughs> doesn't want to hear about the flops anymore. I'm sorry. I can't. Leo's ambient song would be Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin. It's good. It's good. It's a little pessimistic. <laughs> Not as pessimistic as Highway to Heaven. <laughs> I love reading, but I have a tendency to start a book and then imagine another book might be even better or more exciting. It's mm -hmm. like FOMO, but for books. <laughs> Other book. <laughs> I love it. I didn't know, by the way, I didn't know what FOMO meant until I was like 39. Well, it's a new thing! Yeah, but no, I mean, the idea of fear of missing out it had long existed, it's just that the acronym was yeah. Um, What do you think advice could you give me for focusing on one book at a time? I think that I try to make decisions based on what I will enjoy, not what I feel like I. Uh, like, will feel bad about missing, you know? Sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm gonna, like, I have to do that because I'm going to feel bad if I don't do it. I don't like, want to make decisions based on my bad feelings, I want to make things based on my good feelings. So, like, I, I when, I'm, when I'm in a book, I want to have good feelings, and if I'm not in good feelings about the book, I'll totally move on. Um, but, but I want to be in that good feeling and focus on that. And, and yes, to the exclusion of all other books. Um, and, and I don't, have a problem with that anymore. I feel like I, I definitely did at one point, but now, now I can, I can give it, I can give in. So you gotta, you gotta let yourself go. Give in to the book. Well, there's so many versions of this in a human life though, right? Like your life could always be a little bit different and you always think like, well, what if my life was a little bit different this way? It, mm. it might be better. Um, but yeah, if you think about, to think that way. if you spend all the time thinking about what you don't have, you will literally, you know, like, you can't be satisfied because there will always be something that you don't have. Um, and when I, I, I actually do more than one book at a time a lot of times, which I know is terrible and I shouldn't do it or whatever, and people have criticized. Do you, John? Huh? Do you? Do I what? Do you, do you, do you. <laughs> it's a phrase. Do, do you. Be, enjoy being the you want to be. Oh. You, you, yeah. You, like, you be the person you want to be. Yeah. It's been a long time since I was on Twitter. That's probably a Twitter thing. Yeah. <laughs> I got that far before I mentioned the social media. I guess, <laughs> I quit using Twitter. <laughs> it's like when someone tells you that they went to college just outside of Boston. <laughs> Where'd you go? Oh, I'm like, oh, Harvard. <laughs> <sighs> but yes, it's true, I don't use Twitter. <laughs> Although I, I just I, look at it. I, yeah, I was going to say, I do look at it all the time. Um, I just don't post to it because I feel like, you know, it has enough information. <laughs> anyway, um, I read more than one book at a time, and uh, partly that is maybe because I'm, I, I, sometimes I get bored or, or I want to be thinking about a different thing. A lot of times I'm reading a novel and a non fiction book at the same time because the non fiction books are like long and big and they, they, I, I kind of can't stick with them forever. But whenever I'm, whenever I'm reading something or watching TV or, or engaging with any kind of art, I try to think about what I am doing and not what I'm not doing because if I think about what I'm not doing, then I'm just kind of perpetually dissatisfied. I, yeah, I think that's a great, that's a great sort of microcosmos for one of the big problems that is hard to avoid in life, which is always thinking about what that other decision might have led to. And there's no productivity there. Truly. This next one comes from It's time for a million dollar idea! Another million dollar idea! Somebody on the internet tweeted this million dollar idea! It's from Craig! Thanks, Craig. On Twitter. I just found it by searching for million dollar idea. Didn't have any likes, John. Um, well, uh, reading it, I know why. <laughs> million dollar idea. 12 volt axe body spray warmer fits in cup holder, maybe? <laughs> well, okay. I want to confirm what this idea is before I, I give you my review. Okay. This is a. It's in your car. It's in your car. I assume. I don't know where else to go. You stick it. You stick it. 
stick an electric, you stick the end of the car lighter. Yeah, the, yeah what used to be called the cigarette lighter, and it's now called the whatever, 12 volt, 12 volt thing. And on the other side is, is pressurized Axe body spray. <laughs> that it warms. Yeah. Does it warm the pressurized can? <laughs> yes. It warms the. It gets it. It gets it just warm enough for it to be warm, but not so warm that, that you, you die. The worst, worst cause of death. The worst one. They have to. They have to put it on the death list and cause of death, and it's just like the worst one. We've ever heard of! Axe body spray fireball. <laughs> In Mazda. <laughs> I was gonna say, I was gonna say PT Cruiser. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I hate everything about this idea. Uh, I mean, even scientifically it doesn't work, like pressurized gas is cool when they're unpressurized, so even if you warmed it up pretty good, it'd still be cold. Also, just just use less if it's unpleasant, because no one's ever complained about not about there being not like too little axe body spray. I've never <laughs> heard that complaint. I really enjoyed our day. The only thing was that I felt like the axe body spray was a little subtle. <laughs> It's a threat to human safety. <laughs> everything about it is bad. This should never happen, and, and, and it won't. Um, but journey back with me, if you will, those uh, those of you who are like older than fourteen. Journey back with me. When I was fourteen years old, I remember getting ready for a dance, and I had this cologne, mm -hmm. and I I mean it made me feel like a man. <laughs> it, made me, it made me feel like I, it made me feel confident, it made me feel like I was attractive, and I did not underspray it. <laughs> <laughs> like I would like do two things and then like walk through it, and then I'd, I'd like walk away for a bit and I'd be like, nah. <laughs> smelly boy, and I probably smelled way better. Like, yeah, or at least could have. For sure. Yeah. I didn't have this with, uh, <laughs> this is, we're gonna get deep, I didn't have this with a uh, cologne, but I did have a, a jar of Tic Tacs, and I flip them in the Tic Tac lid, and I go, and that made me feel super cool. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, Tic Tac out of a little plastic Tic Tac container. Oh, it's funny all the weird things that you do when you're a kid that you think, like, People saw that and they were like, that kid's cool. Yeah. <laughs> that kid's good. I've really made yeah. my decision. Yeah. I finally... I mean, by the way, thank God you were just like flipping in Tic Tacs. Meanwhile, your brother's dipping. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we're in North Carolina. Do you know what Tic Tacs is? I don't, I don't dip anymore. The last time I dipped was at my cousin's wedding and my, my grandmother my nanny from, uh, from outside of Milan, Tennessee, uh, was at the reception and uh, she walked past me and she looked at me and she said, are you dipping? <laughs> and I was like, no. <laughs> and that was it, man. that was the end of my career. Oh, goodness gracious. All right. Which reminds me, John, that today's podcast is brought to you by Never Dipping. <laughs> uh, stuff, probably best not to start. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Today, today's podcast is brought to you by Oak Trees. <laughs> Oak Trees, the symbol of the great city of Rumley, North Carolina. export some of what Raleigh has to Indianapolis. <laughs> it's amazing. This podcast is also brought to you by Gregorian Bops. All those good old Gregorian Bops. Oh my god, that is such a good idea. <laughs> that is an actual million dollar idea. Kids Bop, but for Gregorian Bops. <laughs> Oh, 
podcast, of course, also brought to you by the Axe Body Spray Fireball. The Axe Body Spray Fireball, avoid it. <laughs> it's so easy to avoid. It's just like Do not plug in your body spray. So that's the only, the only necessary step. <laughs> I've got another question. Yeah. We're still doing that podcast, but still this day one. This is from Ellie, whose ambulance song would be Karma by AJR. I don't know that one. But, yeah, AJR fans in the audience, I might have just met Ellie. Recently, I was at a wedding and at the reception, I was standing with my older brother and my mother talking about what I wanted at my wedding when I get married. Oh my god, this is an amazing question. I was trying to tell them that I wanted a trellis with flowers. But I accidentally told him that I wanted a trebuchet. <laughs> this is the this is a catapult. For those of you who might not know that a trebuchet. It's a siege. It's a siege weapon. It's not a catapult. Sorry, it's not a catapult. It's a siege weapon. 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 It's a siege it's a large rock throw. Anyway, my brother and mother found this very amusing and told my father and my best friend, now they all call me Trebuchet Girl. <laughs> and my brother, who has been to Trebuchet before, <laughs> I don't care about that. has started the design for my Trebuchet. <laughs> what do I do to make everyone forget about this? Ellie, Ellie, lean in. Lean in. <laughs> you know, if you want your trellis to be covered in beautiful flowers, but your trebuchet can be covered in beautiful flowers too. Ellie, the number of people who've had really, really beautiful trellises at their weddings is high. Yeah. The number of people who have had amazing, <laughs> high quality trebuchets that Catapult. It's a bouquet! It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a trebuchet for bouquet! Yeah. Okay, it sounds similar. It's trebuchet! Let me know what I can do. I don't know how close you are to getting married. It's not clear to this. It could be that you're here at this point. It's, 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 I, I'm going to guess that there's a considerable distance between you and, and your marriage, so it's possible that in the intervening years you'll be able to maybe like just ever, hope everybody forgets. But I'm going to be honest with you, Ellie, it's very unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> this, some, some things stick. It, it's going to stick. <laughs> and um, I think that you should have like an amazing trebuchet wedding. <laughs> I think you should have like a 21 trebuchet silver. <laughs> yeah. No, you have to, yeah, like to, to come to the wedding, you have to bring a trebuchet. Not a big one. Or not a big one. You just need to bring something that the trebuchet can carry. Right. You can bring a watermelon. <laughs> yeah, you. Right, any kind of board. <laughs> Don't put the mixer on there, that's for you know, the rest of your life. But everything else. Yeah, don't register for presents, only register for like cannonballs. <laughs> <laughs> I think you got a real opportunity here. <laughs> Alright, this next question comes from Megan, who asks I attend a tiny school and play for the rugby team, so I'm fairly well known around campus. However, there is a girl I pass almost every day who, without fail, will wave with me and say, Hello, Matt. <laughs> this brief interaction brightens my day if she seems genuinely happy to see me, but my name, as mentioned earlier, is Megan, not Matt. <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, we've never talked before, so I'm not sure where she got this idea. How do I tell her my real name without making the greeting awkward, or worse, having her stop it altogether? So far, I just wave back and act as if nothing is amiss. So your only real concern here is that Matt spreads. Like, right. which I'm not wrong with one Matt person, because I have many people like this in my life who think my name is something and are wrong, and I just, it's fine. I Matt also have many people, they all think my name is Hank. <laughs> <laughs> I once walked into a bar and a guy pointed at me with both fingers and said, Vsauce. <laughs> Fine with me. <laughs> that works. Yeah. It's good. Early 
earlier today, Hank and I were in an airport, and I like snuck up on Hank while he was working on his book and took a took like a surprise selfie, you know, to, to post to the community channel of our YouTube channel. And afterwards, like 15 minutes later, when Hank got up, a young woman walked up to him and said, I'm really sorry about what that fan did. That was really <laughs> I just want to say I really like your work and what you've done on Crash Course has made a big impact in my life and again I'm really sorry. Most <laughs> people aren't like that. And it's time to John just dangerous. <laughs> uh, let me explain the situation. Who did we tell that story to earn? Oh, it's for a plug that's video on Tuesday. Oh, so I'm giving it to enjoy it twice. <laughs> The slightly less severe version. John does modify stories as they go along. You see how you can see how they structure themselves. What are we talking about? Max! Max! <laughs> Megan! No! I think it's Matt. <laughs> Do you say Megan? Not in this case, no. Because you did just then. No, I definitely didn't. Did you say the word Megan? Megan? How do you say it? Megan. We're the brothers! <laughs> Megan. 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 <laughs> Raise your hand if you're if you think Megan. I'm in. <laughs> okay, and then John's way, you say? Megan. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, no, I'm What is your name? Such joy. 
I cannot imagine that it would be a, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but it, it doesn't seem like it would be like an inherent like red flag or yellow flag, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it depends on the person. Um, yeah, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a yellow flag for me. I would be kind of psyched because then I would get to like know what I was working against every day. Right, you know how to dress. Yeah, you know exactly. You know Many exactly. times Sarah will like put on an outfit for a big thing, and I'll be like, oh geez, now I gotta like figure out how to look good next to this yeah. work of art. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for gesturing me. <laughs> <laughs> Standing for my wife and my mother. <laughs> I feel like it was a weird to be made. Um, I think like the big thing is like it's a you always know the first conversation you're gonna have, and that's a huge weight off. It is true. I, it's always the first conversation with someone I meet. Yeah. You could have a card. This is something we've discussed on the podcast before, where people are like, are you wearing all yellow and you just have the card? And it's like, yes. I actually was like, yeah. So yeah. I just assign my friends to do this, the spiel, we all know. Yeah. Everybody, yeah. You, know, you know the questions that are coming. Do you suspect that you will be a monochromatist for the rest of your life? I truly hope so. I truly hope okay. so. Okay. Unless something goes terribly wrong, you're gonna be wearing only yellow for your I love it. I love it. Keep it. Yes. Let nothing hold you back. Yes. yes. Yellow is a very sexy color. To answer the one yes of your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our resident monochromatist, which is my new favorite word. Hello. Yes, multiple colors, polychromatists, you know. <laughs> uh, and my question was, so I've been going to college for about a year and a half now, but I still feel like I haven't gotten to know the small city I live in that well, so I was wondering when y'all go to a new city, what are some of the first things you do or the first places you try to go that mm. you know in place? I have a great question. To a college, and I just went back to the place where I went to college, so I was in St. Petersburg yesterday where I went to my undergrad, what? and I went, woo, St. Petersburg! <laughs> Like, this was here? Like, this was here. All of that stuff. Not all of it, but like a lot of it was there. There were so many, like, there were like three different art museums in St. Petersburg that I had never been to despite being there for four years. Now, St. Petersburg is a pretty big town, so it has some stuff going on, which is nice. But um, my main suggestion is to actually go to the places where places are, which is sort of the downtown, and then like walk the streets. Check to make sure that you're not going to go to any neighborhoods that might be bad. Uh, but I, I often, when I go to bigger cities, what I do, if I have extra time, is I will, um, I will program my phone to tell me which direction to turn at the next intersection, and I'll just let it get me lost, which is really nice. And you find stuff that you wouldn't otherwise see and um, sort of get a better feeling for it. Also, I might suggest sort of like finding a haunt. Like if there's a coffee shop downtown that you can like be at and get comfortable in and sort of have like, that be your base of operations. Right, and then you kind of build the hubs from that, uh, you build the, 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 the spokes from that hub. Right, sorry. Got it. Um, <laughs> the other thing I would recommend is going to museums. Uh, not just art museums, but also weird museums. Yes, like, we have a, so the Museum of Mountain Flying, uh, where they have planes that flew over mountains. Apparently, they really, it's, it's got everything. It's got a cheap, um... <laughs> but it's one of those things, like, you go there, and you go there kind of as a joke. But then while you're there, you're reading a plaque, and you're like, oh, I did not know that. And I did not know that about my hometown. Like, I live quite close to the world's largest ball of paint, um, which is now, like, I don't know, much larger than a human being, and it started out as just a baseball that one guy has obsessively painted for 40 years. And I went to the world's largest ball of paint, like, as a joke, and then while I was there, I was like, this is beautiful, and it is everything that I love about humanity, and I am so glad that I saw it in real life, and tears sprang into my eyes. So you never know. You never know. Art museums are great because they change what's there. Even if they're just reinstalling a permanent collection, every few months you can go and have a new experience, read different wall labels, learn about different art. But there's also lots of other kinds of museums. 
And in small towns like in Indianapolis, they also have the IndyCar Museum featuring every car that ever won the Indianapolis 500. That sounds like it takes up a lot of space. It's a, it, it is one of the physically largest museums in America. Right? Thank you for asking. <laughs> Um, so that's the kind of stuff that I like to do because there are so, and also going to the public library, especially like a, a good downtown uh, library, because uh, there are so many wonderful public amenities that very few of us end up taking uh, advantage of. Um, going to the Indianapolis Library is like one of the great joys of my life. It's one of the only places where everybody walks in and is truly equal, and everybody has true equal access to information. Um, so yeah, those are some of the things that I've encouraged. What's the, what's the small town you're in? She didn't name it for a reason. Oh, yeah. okay. That's fine. Good, I thought, perfect. <laughs> we'll just edit out. Yeah. Um, Have a private night. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you.
Just, if you're gonna, I love to tell a story that's like 60% true, so I'm just gonna give you advice. I said he sure does. Yeah. Um, well, that it makes them better. <laughs> I would I would say you put the bumper stickers on random people's cars. Well, that's what she said. I thought she said houses. <laughs> no, just on random people's heads. Oh uh, wait. In the face. Oh my god. Watch my hands. That's not no. But now I'm gonna. 45 minute shower. <laughs> um, it turns out you had the story perfect to start. Right? You're a genius at, at spoon cults, and congratulations on, on being interesting and going to college. Yes, let us know if you need any merchandise at dftba.com. We're ready to serve your spoon cult needs. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. just statistically, and John, thank you for being on this podcast with me, it's been a joy. Yeah, thank y'all so much for being here, it really has been really special to be with you tonight. If you're part of the meet and greet, you, you stay here and then you'll be herded into, I don't know how it's going to work, but just stay in your seats, and then if you're not part of the meet and greet, then unfortunately you do have to leave. But the good news is that a whole Saturday night awaits you, and who knows what will happen. If you're like me, you'll go to bed. But yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for supporting our work over the years, uh, for listening to our pods, and uh, for being here with us and making this such a special night uh, for us. We hope that it has been a fun one for you as well, and as they say in our hometown, don't, don't forget, forget to be awesome. awesome. Bye, guys.